Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India The 18th century was probably the most fascinating century in the last 3000 years in Europe. This was the century when the power of science and technology was felt in the way people thought about things. the power of reason instead of faith began to assert itself increasingly there was a tremendous reordering of the social groups in the society the merchants manufacturers were growing more discontent among the peasantry vis-a-vis the aristocracy ideas of freedom and liberty were growing along with theories of natural order and social contract and so on and so forth in some respects 18th century france symbolized the transformation of european mind just as 18th century england symbolized the incredible economic potential of growth for europe so 18th century was a fascinating century one of the important things to happen in the 18th century was the development of the idea of the natural order which governed human society prior to the 13th century in the middle ages for a long time from the 5th century onwards people's conception of society people's conception of lives people's conception of political life were all constrained by a combined existence of authority and faith sorry authority induced fear and respect faith induced submission so these constrained the way people thought about the world around what it basically meant is that everyone said well this is my place in society in my family in this world this is my role my job is to keep performing this role period nothing else and the inducement for them to keep this way came from the way authority was wielded both by the rural rich the aristocracy who created the culture of feudalism and then by the church which gave a metaphysical foundation to the whole thing the church acquired monopoly rights virtually over the way christian mind thought up to the 13th century so this big concrete like combination of authority and faith governing set outlooks to life reinforced by the metaphysics provided by the church constituted the basis of european mindset towards society towards the world around during the middle ages from the 13th century things started changing from 13th century mercantile interest started growing trading grew we know that we knew manufacturing grew but more importantly trading substantially grew the nation state came into existence 
feudalism declined and therefore the world started changing a bit. But even then in the 16th and 17th centuries while the nation states had come into existence substantially in most parts of Europe except England these nation states were ruled by very autocratic monarchs. And very often these autocratic monarchs did not hesitate to use the force of arms. Even in England the middle of six, the middle of 17th century was a period of civil war precisely because the question came about how much power to the monarch till finally the monarch himself was beheaded. So, the 16th and 17th century Europe experienced autocratic monarchies. So, the idea of the world around, the idea of society, the idea of the world of politics was also constrained by, was also supported and philosophies of this type were provided by both Machiavelli in Italy and Hobbes. Both of them were talking about an unrestrained power in the hands of the ruler and unrestrained powers of suppression and subjugation in the hands of the rulers with respect to his subjects. So, the ideas of Machiavelli and Hobbes essentially reflected the disorder that arose when autocratic power was wielded unequivocally. But by 18th century things had changed. In fact, one major change from by 18th century was the fact which we have already seen of the tremendous growth of mercantile power. You see merchants were getting richer they had more and more money to spend, to invest and to get involved in society, but they had no place in the body politic. They were neither the aristocracy nor were they the monarchy. So, they did not have an independent base of power. So, they were clamoring for it, they were pushing for it and by 16th, by 17th century they had acquired considerable power. So, medieval world view was changing first into a world view where some kind of autocratic tyrannical rule was philosophically justified in the words of Machiavelli and Hobbes, but the rise of the merchant power would not accept such autocratic power emergence. So, there was a growing pressure from the mercantile interests for participation and for sharing in the booty of ruling. After all merchants would not want to be a part of the state ruling machinery simply because of philanthropic reasons. So, this was another pressure. Then you had simultaneously the growth of secular knowledge. As we had seen earlier, educational institutions with serious purpose were being set up across Europe. In the 200 years leading to 18th century, it is estimated that the number of universities and such establishments nearly doubled in Europe, which means the discourse of reason outside of the ecclesiastic boundaries acquired significance. These secular educational institutions were teaching philosophy, law, well some amount of science, mathematics and so forth, but the basis was not faith. They were not trying to study these things for the greater glory of God. 
they were simply studying these things because that was the nature of the quest for knowledge. So, the discourse of reason acquired greater and greater, and greater power among the thinking people and newer political and social philosophies became necessary which would replace the philosophies either dealing with the metaphysics of the church or by the coercive power of the state. In either case the need for change was significant. It is about this time too that the philosophical ideas of freedom and natural order without any recourse to either divine intervention or the providence or without any coercive power of the state. So, you did not need something like Hobbes's theory of Leviathan anymore because it simply because it became irrelevant. People were thinking of something else, they wanted something else. So, you had the merchant class clamoring for power, you had the new thinking coming up in through the growth of secular education and science and technology. So, people started thinking towards explaining society in terms which are neither acts of providence nor acts of governance. In other words, they did not want a theory which explained the power of the state as the source of everything, nor did they want a theory which explained the providence or God or religion as a source of everything around. People were looking at expressions of the order of the society, order of life around them in terms which were simple, logical, pragmatic. and which did not need any substantial faith or fear to believe in them. This was how theories of natural order started coming up in the 18th century. The part which relates to us is the part which relates to market. The theories which developed in economics in the 18th century which had some notion of natural order in them were theories about market. All these three sets of theories which we shall be discussing are theories which were talking of the free market as the natural order and the fulfillment of the freedom of the market as attaining some kind of a natural equilibrium in the long run for these societies. So, you can see from the state administered, state dominated mercantilist views, ideas shifted dramatically by the middle of 18th century to a belief that there is a natural order if each person performed according to the drive of his self interest, if each person performed according to the drive of his talents then the whole society would evolve in a direction which would be harmonious in a state of equilibrium and all of which would be natural and therefore, markets themselves started being looked at as forms of natural order. No reason then that in the 30 years from the middle of 1750s to the middle of 1780s saw the demise of mercantilism because mercantilism was so opposed, so diametrically different from this conception of the economy as a natural order. We shall discuss three sets of ideas of 18th century which were very prominent in highlighting this conception of natural order. We had the physiocrats in the middle of 1750s and for the next 15 years 
really dominating the intellectual world across Europe, who looked at the economy for the first time as a totality, which had to be dealt with as a totality. In other words, the physiocratic version of the economy was probably the first macroeconomic articulation ever in economic theory. And you had along with physiocrats about the same time Galliani and the Italian economists who were making very clear lucid pronouncements of how markets worked and how there was a natural tendency of markets to lead to some long term equilibrium, some kind of a normal state for markets to be in. So, this was the Italian contribution and then Smith from the middle of the 18th century from the 1760s in fact and then 1770s. Was speaking and writing about the power of market and the impulse of egocentric behavior both leading to the coming into existence of an invisible hand which ran the whole economy. In other words, there was a spontaneity about the egocentric behavior of individuals within the freedom of the market which enabled there to be some kind of a hand of fate, but no fate which you need to go to a church to believe in. But this was the hand of a market which determined the lives and fortunes of people, the invisible hand. So, Smith was talking about the natural order in terms of this invisible hand. So, we will talk about these three people today. Have you studied something about the physiocrats earlier? Anybody? Have you heard about the physiocrats? You had this course on great thinkers and so forth. No? Did you have any other course on history, politics of Europe, ideas? You had. Okay. So did you? Did you? Did you at any point of time talk about people in the middle of 18th century, France? Certainly, as philosophers, you probably did not consider Kene and the physiocrats. Okay, then, in the early part of 18th century, in fact, around 1719, Boy formulated a system of an agrarian economy. He believed that agriculture was the principal economic occupation and around that the rest of the economy revolved and functioned. So, he said agriculture is the only productive part of the economy and it should be allowed complete freedom by removal of all kinds of age old restrictions on agriculture not in terms of multiplicity of duties and taxes, but also in terms of restrictions of trade within the country in agricultural products. So, Boy Gebert and his predecessor Vauban both believed that freedom of agriculture from oppression by the state was the first condition for economic prosperity. So, they advocated as I said a considerable liberalization of the tax regime principally through 
a very simplified tax regime which does not demand much and did not create much transaction cost for the farmers. I will have something to say on this perhaps you have not heard of this idea of transaction cost. But then aside from the tax regime they also wanted a number of restrictions on trade within the country to be removed on internal trade in agricultural goods. But I mentioned transaction costs have you heard of in economics the idea of transaction costs tell me something about it. Finding the good that you need or reaching the uh, service or the good that you need, like that's a transaction cost. I mean, what kind of forms can this cost take? Transport. No, that's. Oh, well, that's transportation cost. No, you don't need to open. transact. Information is one part of transaction cost, yes. Cost of information. Time. Sure, time is a cost, but what do you time spend time over here in this particular case? Buyers have to meet sellers in a marketplace. So the time uh, lost while, while So the expenditure of time is a real expenditure to acquire a product and to sell a product. I mean what I am trying to say is it is possible for you to quantify time in some way or other because you have 24 hours in the day you must be able to quantify. Fantastic, lovely, beautiful. So uh, negotiation time, acquiring information and what else? Bookkeeping. Okay, maintenance of records, very nice. So these are costs uh, which you rightly ad, uh, admit to be cost direct, directly dealing with the process of transactions having to go on. There are other transaction costs too. Have you for instance thought what would happen, I'll give you an example, what would happen if you went to a shop and bought a kilogram of tomatoes. Hmm. So you paid 20 rupees, 25 rupees, whatever you paid for that kilogram of tomatoes, took the bag, paid him 20 rupees or whatever it is and on the point of leaving the shop, what stops a shopkeeper from landing nice and juicy one on your head and then taking the bag back saying, okay, now off you go. What prevents the shopkeeper from doing that? Why can't he just snatch the bag away from you, give you one and say well, that is it? So what would happen if he reports? If you report his behavior, what, what he did was wrong because he took the money for the <coughs> bag of tomatoes and he did not give you the tomatoes. So. So that's that's criminal. <laughs> so it's right. So incredible, incredible as it seems, the example has pointed out to the fact that there is a thing called crime involved in this. No, and crime is defined by law. Right. I mean, somebody can walk up to you and say you're an ass. It's not a crime. It's an offense it is an offence, you can probably sue the person, right? You can say, you can tell the police, the person called me an ass, I am having a mental breakdown after that. So I am pressing criminal charges of assault. Well, you can make it crime, but eventually laws tell you what you can do, what you cannot do. Am I right? So, you are absolutely right. Even if this shopkeeper was not worried much about having to lose a customer, he would certainly be worried about the cops landing up in his shop and saying, okay, now what do you do with this man? You take his tomatoes or not? Off with you. Let us go to the police station. We are charging you on criminal conduct. 
etc., etc., etc. So there is fear of law. Am I not right? There is fear of law. Any time such violative behavior occurs, violation of a transaction, a contract. So when the when you buy the tomatoes from the shopkeeper, there is an explicit or implicit contract that the tomatoes are yours in as much as the 20 rupees are his. Any attempt to reverse that is a violation. Right? So there are laws which protect contracts, which protect transactions so that they are not violated again. Hmm? Who makes those laws? State. What does it mean, state? The, the chief minister? No, legitimate authority. That is, uh, okay. In in case of like uh, that way, if you look at it, the legislature legislature uh, legislature forms makes laws, list of laws saying which is acceptable, which is not acceptable. What's the punishment? What is the reward, etc. Okay, so there are lawmakers, and then. Is a judiciary that identifies this. Okay, so the judiciary which uh, examines particular events relating to conduct of people and trying to find out whether this is a crime in uh, according to this law, that law, there is a violation of this law, that law, and therefore what punishment or what penalty should be administered. So, judiciary and you forgot the cops. Right, I mean you need a guy eventually to arrest you and put you in jail, no? Mm. I mean the judge can uh, you know, yammer away as much as he wants and uh, you, can, you can just say pada, no? So there is this problem. You need people who will create the law, you will need people who will interpret the law and you need people who will execute the law, right? Do not they need a house to live in? Do not they need to eat food? Do not they have children to send to school? Do not all these people in short have the need to live like anybody else? So what will they take for that? They will take a salary. Who pays them the salary? The people who collect the tax from you gives them salary. So you need a bunch of fellows who will collect the taxes. So you need a bunch of fellows who will frame the tax laws, how much tax you should pay and there are tax collectors maybe. In short, by and by we are talking of the entire establishment called bureaucracy, right? called legislators and called judiciary. In other words, all the three organs of a modern state have to be created, sustained and kept working. And where does the money for all that come from? Taxes, right? So the taxes pay for the sustenance of the organs of modern state which enable you to keep your tomatoes in your pocket. In other words, which ensure that your transactions are sacred in the eyes of law at least, sanctity in the eyes of law. No, these costs are all transaction costs, are they not? Hmm? Maintaining the entire infrastructure of the, of the body politic and uh, the state, the government and so on and so forth. Now, a good efficient governance system would ensure that you pay the least tax to sustain all these things, right? And not only that, would ensure that you are not subjected to too many rules and regulations and harassment in the name of law. In short, there can be efficient transaction, transaction regimes and inefficient transaction regimes. Am I not right? Inefficient transaction regimes are costly one way or other. They cost time, they cost resources, they cost people's you know, states of mind, tension, stress, you name it. 
So, a state or a society or a governance system can be so organized that it can either minimize transaction costs or maximize transaction costs by the way it is designed and by the way it functions. I am hmm? saying all these things because what Vauban and Boyer were suggesting is that the transaction costs in the French economy for prosperous agriculture must be minimal. Is not that what they were suggesting? They were not saying this because the language of transaction costs is a modern language, but what in effect they were trying to hustle through is a low transaction cost regime with a simplified tax structure and with very simplified procedures, rules and norms. No? So, they had a conception of natural order, whereby if the system is by and large left alone by the state, it had a tendency to run itself smoothly and effectively, is not it. So, the physiocratic natural order was an agrarian natural order, which means it was based on agriculture and a society which was organized around agriculture. Physiocrats took over from Boyer and built a sophisticated system. The founder of the school and the greatest celebrity in the school was a man called Kinet and he was a physician in the court of King Louis the 14th. Kinet thought that the society was something like body of a living organism. Different organs and components of this living organism were connected through a set of flows which involved blood, body fluids and so on and so forth. So, these flows connected and functionally rendered meaningful the organism itself. right? So, Kinney looked at the economic process in analogous terms as if they were organic things. He thought there were three functional groups in which society was organized. One were the farmers who worked on the land and who grew all the farm and sometimes primary sector produce like fisheries, forestries, mines. These were all brought under one broad classification by Kinney and his followers, they were all called the productive class. They were all called the productive class. They were called the productive class because they worked with land and nature and according to the physiocrats, land and nature were the only productive things which yielded thing to humanity. So, these people were farmers were for instance productive because they were able to till the land and get out of land something which not merely sustained themselves, but it sustained the entire society. In other words over and above what they could they needed to grow for their own consumption, they were able to grow things which was useful to them as investments in the ongoing reproduction of agriculture. For instance, they grew not only food for themselves, but they had food grains which were used as seeds. They had cattle which not only produced milk and milk products for themselves and maybe beef, 
but they also this cattle also reproduced itself they produced more cattle in other words they dealt with nature in such a way that not only was their subsistence taken care of but the reproduction of the productive activity year after year was also taken care of and then on top of it all it supported the other people in the society who were these other people according to kinney there were two other classes one is what he called the the distributive class which basically meant the landlords the landlords were called distributive class because they got the surplus from agriculture over and above what he produced for himself and for the reproduction of his agriculture the farmer also produced something which he had to give to the landlord isn't it because the land belonged to him the property class so the landlord got his rent part of which he spent on his consumption no all of it he spent on his consumption but part of what he spent on his consumption went back to the farmer he brought butter he bought uh, food grains he bought meat he got poultry he got chicken you name it right then he spent money on the other class the third class the third class consisted of artisans manufacturers traders bankers all sorts of people who were neither doing distributive job nor were they productive in the sense that they let, let, dealt with land or anything this class can i called le class sterile because they are a sterile class unproductive class it didn't mean that they were wasters it didn't mean that they were useless but what it meant was that these people were not productive in the sense that they were not working with nature with land which is only which is the only thing capable of producing a surplus the surplus which went to the landlords was called produit net which means net produce this net produce was over and above what the farmer needed for himself to sustain and reproduce his farming activities and then to buy some things from le class sterile he might need a plow he might need a little uh, you know something for his agriculture he might need to dig a well and he might need to you know there are so many things which are involved in the transactions with the sterile class so he spent some money on the sterile class over and above this the farmer has a surplus which goes into the hands of the distributive class or the landlords and the landlords they spent part of what part of what they get to sustain the sterile class and another part to buy things from agriculture so the output from land keeps doing its flows circular flows across the economy give you an example suppose the farmer grew 10 million tons worth food products and other products about 2 million tons he would spend on sustaining and reproducing this activity he need to have seeds he need to have look he need to look after the farming conditions the dairying conditions and feed the feed the stock and so forth so about let's say 20% of that goes into looking after all this for reproduction of his own activities then another 20% goes to the landlords as rent right so that makes it 20 and 20 40% hmm or would you rather have it okay let's do a little arithmetical revision let's say 40% of all that he grows he he goes to sustain his own self his reproduction of his farming dairying another 40% goes as rent 
So you have 20 percent left, which 20 percent is given to like last steril for buying his farming equipment and anything which they manufacture and little bit of money lending for which he pays the interest and so on and so forth. So you have 10 million tons of output out of, out of which 4 million tons goes to plow back and reproduce his own agricultural condition. Another 40 grows goes as produce net or the net produce into the hands of the landlords right and 20 percent goes to the lay class sterile the sterile class. Now out of the 40 that the landlord gets 20 percent goes back to the farmer to buy his produce another 20 percent goes into the hands of lay class sterile to buy manufactured and traded produce right. And eventually you find that the whole thing completes a circle and the 60 percent which goes out of the farmer's hands keeps doing the rounds coming back year after year after year there is a 40 percent which goes back into the maintenance and sustenance and reproduction of agriculture. The another 60 percent goes to the landlords go to the sterile class comes back to him because eventually the sterile class also buy agricultural produce from him. So this is a picture of macroeconomic flows among different groups of people which were the first time the macro picture of the economy distributed among different occupational groups and as a series of flows among these occupational flows and eventually resting on a notion of repeated recurrence of an equilibrium. Each year it is 10 million tons it does all the rounds you are back with 10 million tons you do again another 10 million tons you do all the rounds again each year this 40 percent grows another 10 million tons that does the rounds then it comes back then it does another round another 10. So it is a static system of continuous reproduction of economic processes this was the physiocratic conception of natural order. you have any question on that? Funny, any question? All right, I will take that as a compliment. <laughs> anyway, so this natural order was also a free economy because things happened on its own it does not need anybody it does not need any state to push it prod it it does not need any church to do it. it was a society which continued to generate itself. So the genius of Kine lay in perceiving economy and economic processes as a continuous self sustaining self generating processes and he saw this as a function of free market and the free market which enabled this traditional system to continue was the natural order. There are two things which are interesting about this. One, the idea that an economy and a society can continuously sustain itself reproduce itself year after year after year without any external stimulus or external push or pull or prod that you could just go on and on and on is one. And the second that this occurred precisely because there was an unfettered market which enabled these flows across the groups. So this was the core of modern macroeconomics which was first founded in Kine. Now Kine's ideas 
inspired people all over Europe. As you can see, he formulated the tableau economic in which the system of flows which I discussed with you that happened and most important some laissez faire system, minimal interference with government and he said you need one tax in the system, uh, just one tax and this one tax should recover all the costs of the government of governance. In other words, unwittingly he was talking about a system which minimized transaction costs. One step ahead of Boy, Gebert and others. And in furtherance of the minimization of con transaction costs, he was also saying, we want minimal government restrictions and regulation of trade. Just let it go on, it will grow, it will prosper and France will be in a good shape. An interesting thing is, we have chosen people to talk about here who are all writing more or less the same kind of stuff, very similar stuff, but in different parts of Europe in the middle of 18th century. You had Galliani in Italy belonging to the Naples school, you had Kinney in Paris and then you have Smith in Scotland, University of Edinburgh. So, but their preoccupation with market as some kind of a natural order which should not be tampered with symbolize the spirit of the times, symbolize the arrival of modernity in human thinking that life does not need a tyrannical state, life does not need a tyrannical god, life simply needs to be left alone to be run by itself and for reason to understand. This time had arrived. So, Galliani. Galliani was looking at the value of goods and how they are determined in the market. He said there were three factors that can lead to the creation of value. One was the labor, its quality and its price. Mind you, he is not talking of labor theory of value here. Labor theory of value simply says amount of effort and it tries to quantify the effort involved. Whereas here, Galliani is saying, well, you might have quantity of labor, but more importantly, what quality of labor are you talking of? So, he differentiated among workers. He did not homogenize them as in contrast with labor theory of value. And then he said, what you pay for them, the wages for laborers. So, he says all these three things will result in the estimate of something called fatika, which is something like an imputed labor cost, but which had nothing to do with something like labor theory of value you will understand. Then secondly, he also talked about the value in use for the goods. That is, people want things because they are useful. People want things because there is a value when they use, which they use in the products. In other words, he was the first person who came pretty close to talking about something called utility. They did not know the concept then, the concept came later with Bentham and his followers towards the end of 18th, early 19th century. But Galliani, some 30 years before Bentham, was talking about fatika and use value. And finally, the scarcity which people felt for the good. It might, I find, I might find it useful, but it might not be easily obtainable. So, there were three components to the value of a good or three components to price formation. One is fatika, another is the use value and the third is the scarcity. Now, he 
was also talking in terms of value of goods in terms of other goods because he said every everything had a value in terms of fatika and uh, in terms of usefulness and in terms of scarcity so if everything had such a value determination process then there must be a value of goods in terms of each other you can talk of one pair of bullocks equaling so many bicycles or so many bicycles or one bicycle equaling equaling so many apples so he was talking in terms of some kind of a rate of substitution according to the usefulness of commodities principally across the economy right probably probably a precursor to the modern notion of the marginal rate of substitution of goods along an indifferent surface right but he wasn't going going that far but certainly wilfredo pareto who was great at these things and who was a great welfare economist and who used this analysis of indifferent surfaces extensively did believe that galliani was a precursor to his own work galani was also looking at the distribution of goods over time in other words the market distributes goods allocates goods according to the value as determined by fatika and scarcity and utility at a given point in time but goods are also distributed over time in other words i can give you 100 rupees which you can put into some business and tomorrow it might yield some goods worth 200 rupees so what i am doing is i am redistributing today's goods to determine something in the future so you are talking of an allocation of goods through time galliani was the first economist to think of this and he was the first economist to also understood that that goods produced tomorrow with today's money are worth less than goods today a bird in hand is better than two tomorrow it might take a day for you to get through the bush to get the two bird, two birds so the long and short of it all is galliani was also formulating some kind of idea of rate of discount at which you can estimate the net present worth of future incomes and he said interest is some kind of a intrinsic price for the risk and inconvenience and waiting involved in this process of intertemporal distribution hmm galliani entirely sympathized with the physiocrats in terms of their preoccupation with the natural order but he said categorically that it's not agriculture alone which produced surplus surplus came from every form of improvement in one's effort so he brought labor into consideration and said different qualities and different intensities and different types of labor can produce surplus so he said manufacturing is capable of generating a surplus which has no risk in agriculture if there is a rain there is no rain you have had it but whether there is rain or not you can manufacture secondly agriculture was constrained by availability of land you need much less land for manufacturing and third manufacturing generated so much of surplus that it could benefit agriculture itself so on these three counts galliani expressed his disagreement with the physiocrats he agreed with the physiocratic idea that there is a natural order of an economy most important contribution of galliani is that the self regulatory equilibrium which physiocrats started talking about which galliani approved of he said in this self regulatory equilibrium of the economy happened in the long run it didn't happen immediately in the short run there were all kinds of disturbances in the economy which led to fluctuations 
So, Galliani was the first one to bring in the conception of long run equilibrium in the economy as distinct from short run equilibrium and showed the distinction between short run fluctuations and long run equilibria. And more important, he almost anticipated Keynes when he said the long run itself could be a succession of these a number of short runs. So, that eventually your progress to some kind of equilibrium in the long run could only be asymptotic. You might be getting there and getting there and getting there. So, this again was a tremendous contribution in theoretical thinking. <laughs> what we will do is we will pick up on Adam Smith in the next class which is on Saturday. I was going to teach Adam Smith anyway next class, but what I was going to introduce Adam Smith with today I will add it on to what I am going to speak on Saturday and we will do it on Saturday. Good evening. <laughs>